Let's assume now that we've proved, just to continue with this presentation, that there must be certain categories. Would, that would then bring us to the question, well, what are they? And that's what's called the metaphysical deduction of the categories. How will we find out what are the a priori concepts which necessarily are built into the mind and govern all our thinking? Now, we already are taking for granted we know they must be there. So it's just a question, in effect, that we've, we've got a room in which we know there are people, and it's just a question of finding out which people. We've already proved they're there, supposedly, and now we want to find out what they are. Again, I'll give you an indication of how Kant goes about it. When we were looking for the necessary forms of perception, how did we do it? Well, we watched ourselves actually perceiving. We watched our sensibility at work, and uh, we found that there were certain necessary features in our perception. Well, if we want to find necessary forms of conception, let's watch our conceptual faculty, our understanding, as Kant calls it, at work, and see if we can detect something necessary in its operation. Well, you might ask, what's the work of the understanding? What is it that we do with concepts? And Kant's answer is, we use concepts in order to make judgments, in order to formulate propositions, statements. His commonest word is judgment. On a level of perception, which we share with the animals, we simply stare out blindly. We watch percepts go by. If you have concepts, you can organize your data into conceptual statements. All men are mortal. I am now teaching Kant, etc. So for Kant, the understanding, the conceptual faculty, is the faculty for passing judgments. That simply means making propositions, making statements. If then there are any of these a priori concepts that we're looking for, and we know there must be, if there are any categories, they must show up in the kinds of judgments that we make, in the kinds of propositions that we uh, use as human beings. Well, how will we find them? Well, now observe that in every proposition, in every judgment, we can distinguish two components, which are commonly called by logicians the matter and the form of the judgment, the particular content we're talking about and the type of relationship we ascribe to that content, the way we put it together. I'll give you an example. I'll take three judgments. All men are mortal, all philosophers are poor, all geniuses are original. Now, in each case, the subject matter is different. In the subject, you know, means what we're talking about. The predicate is what we say about it. The subject and predicate are different in each case. Men, mortal, philosophers, poor, geniuses, original. That's the matter of these judgments, the particular subject and predicate. And those, of course, are limitless. They can vary from judgment to judgment. <clears throat> but in the three statements that I gave you, even though the matter, the subjects and predicates differ, the relationship that I ascribe to them is the same. In, in, in all of those cases, I said all of the subject class belongs to the predicate class. All men are mortal, all philosophers are poor, etc. In other words, these judgments all have the same formal structure. All S is P we could symbolize, you see, which is common to them all. And of course, there are many other forms of judgment besides <coughs> all S is P. If I say some horses are not intelligent, some women are not voters, some students are not hardworking, again, my matter varies enormously, my subjects and predicate, but the form in those three cases is some S is not P. I abstract away from the content, that's the structure in which it's embedded. And there are many other forms besides all S is P or some S is not P. Now for Kant, the content of our judgment, the particular S's and P's come from experience. If you remember from last week, uh, Kant said that as he didn't, he didn't say it last week, but he presented it last week that all content, all matter of knowledge comes from experience. It's a posteriori. So if the understanding contributes something a priori, 
and we already know it does from the transcendental deduction, then it must be not the matter of judgments, but the form of judgments, the ways that we put together the subject and predicate. If the understanding contributes anything, and we know it does, it must be the concepts which tell us how to put together subjects and predicates to make judgments. Suppose it should be the case that there are certain necessary ways that a human mind has to use whenever it tries to relate a subject and a predicate. Certain necessary forms or types of judgment. So that no matter what we think about, we have to use these ways, they're absolutely inescapable. Then we could conclude these forms of judgment, not the content now, but the form, the structure of the judgment, must be contributed by the understanding independent of experience. If it's necessary, remember, we can't get it from experience. If there are forms of judgment that are absolutely necessary for us whenever we think, then those forms of judgment must be dictated by the understanding. So his conclusion is simply what the understanding gives us a priori is the necessary ways our minds put together subjects and predicates to make judgments. It's a priori concepts, the categories, are simply the rules specifying the basic kinds of relationships which human beings must employ whenever they try to function conceptually and put the concepts together into propositions. So if we want to find the categories, all we have to do is ask, are there any basic kinds of relationships, basic types of judgments, that our minds have to use whenever they think? And each time we find a form of judgment that's necessary, that means it's a priori, contributed by the mind, then there must underlie and make uh, must underlie it a category, a priori concept. We simply have to list all the necessary forms of judgment, and to each one we'll just read off the corresponding category that makes it possible. Now, since Aristotle, logicians have been concerned to make lists of the forms of judgment, abstracting away from the matter the particular subjects and predicates, simply to make lists of the forms of judgment that all human beings had to use regardless of the particular content. Kant is not original on this point. He simply takes over these standard lists of the types of judgment with certain amendments of his own and then simply says to each type there must correspond the category that makes it possible. Now, you have to know that Kant had a passion for symmetry. Indeed, some people would say an obsession. He was desperate to show that we could end up with four different sets of types of judgments, each with three members. So he had to arrange the types of judgment into sets of three, four sets of three, giving us 12 as a total. And of course, there are means that corresponding to that, there's going to be four sets of categories with three in a set. In order to uh, end up with this scheme, he had to constantly engage in the most unplausible type of classification. And very often, he comes up with so-called categories that you wouldn't have the faintest idea how is it related to the type of judgment which it's supposed to underlie and make possible. Now, I'm not going to try to labor uh, this uh, material because a lot of it is enormously stretched. I just want to briefly run through his list without too much attempt at explanation. And whenever we encounter some particularly bizarre non sequitur, I just simply will note it uh, and pass by without comment. Because simply to satisfy your curiosity, how could he have come up with 12? Well, the first set of three revolves of types of judgment now, revolves around what logicians call the quantity of the judgment. That simply means how much of the subject class are you talking about? And we have, says Kant, three possibilities. 
the universal judgment. You don't have to bother copying these technical names down if you don't want, but you can if you want. The universal judgment, that's all SSP. All men are more, all pigs have snouts, etc. When you talk about all of the subject class. Then what logicians call a particular judgment. That's when you talk about some members of the class, some SSP. Some women are intelligent, some horses are rapid, etc. And then finally is what it was called the singular judgment. That's when you talk about one particular member of the subject class. I say, for instance, Socrates is mortal. That particular woman is tall, etc. Now, the all logicians agreed, and so does Kant, this particular trinity is entirely necessary. Take any judgment you can imagine or conceive, anything whatever, no matter what you're talking about, and either you're talking about a one member of the subject class, or some, meaning more than one and less than all, or all. You've got no way out but to think in terms of one, some, all. Well, if this is a necessary form in which the human mind must think, then there has to be a category corresponding to each, which is what gives it its necessity and makes it possible. How is it that we are able to think all SSP? Now, of course, the S and P we get from experience, but how are we able to grasp the relationship all SSP? Well, says Kant, only because we have the concept unity. When we say all SSP, we're treating all S as one unified group. If we didn't have a concept of unity, of one group, we could never make the judgment all SSP. We couldn't put them together as one, you see. Therefore, the universal type of judgment is made possible by the category unity. The sum SSP type, the particular one, well, that one, we had to have the idea of many in order to get the idea of sum. And that, he says, is the cat. What makes that possible is the category plurality. We had to have the idea of more than one, sum, a number, you see, in order to be able to think sum SSP. And therefore, the second category is plurality. And as for the singular, this uh, SSP, Socrates is mortal. From that, he gets, believe it or not, the category totality, presumably on the ground that the total of Socrates is mortal. He says, by the way, that he is not going to define the categories. And therefore, I will follow him and uh, not provide definitions. What it comes to is this. Our minds are built to think in quantitative terms. We have, in effect, a unity filter, a plurality filter, a totality filter. And if we didn't have these, we could never organize our concepts into the form of universal propositions or particular propositions or singular propositions, which means we could never think all, some, one. In other words, we could never judge at all since judgment requires one of these three forms. But since we do judge in these ways and they're necessary, then the concepts which make them possible must be necessary. In other words, must be categories. A person might fail to have any particular S and P, the concept of it, but he couldn't function at all on the conceptual level if he didn't have the concept all, some, one, or in Kant's terms, unity, plurality, totality. These are the necessary preconditions of conceptual thought. They are, therefore, mind-contributed categories. Now, if you get the pattern, we can run through the rest quickly, because the details are really insignificant. Besides the issue of the quantity of judgments, logicians for a long time had distinguished what they call the quality of judgment. That essentially pertains to whether it's affirmative or negative. Here again, Kant has to come up with three forms. Two of them, at least, are reasonably clear. On the one hand, there's affirmative judgments, where you say that something is the case. Socrates is mortal. Uh, two and two is four, etc. Now, what makes it possible for us to think something is so? Well, we have to have the concept reality. And therefore, 
category, the concept of reality is a presupposition of the affirmative judgment and must be an a priori category, notes. And he claims you couldn't get reality from experience. We have to have the concept reality to even think anything is the case. As soon as we think is the case, that presupposes the concept reality. So to the affirmative judgment, from that we get reality. From the negative type of judgment, such and such is not the case. What makes it possible for us to think that? Well, we don't experience a not, and yet we must have the concept of the not in order to think S is not P. And this one is reasonably clear. That category he calls negation. Uh, negation is what the concept negation is what makes possible negative judgment. Now you'd be probably curious to know what could the third one possibly be once it's got affirmative and negative. I just am going to say this with a straight face. The third one is of the form S is non-P. In other words, Bill is not intelligent is negative. But Bill is unintelligent is a different type of judgment, he claims. Because it's positive in form, I'm saying Bill is, but it has a negative predicate, unintelligent, you see. So it's a sort of a mixture of the preceding two, which he calls an infinite judgment, presumably because it doesn't tell us very much about what Bill is and leaves open infinite possibilities. And what makes this possible, he claims, is a category of limitation. I guess on the idea that it limits Bill. You see that uh, whatever he is, he's non-P. So. Now, uh, you should be able to see that, uh, that uh, just before we go on, that uh, more than one category applies to each judgment. If I say all men are mortal, well, I had to, to arrive at that, I first had to perceive an individual man, which means in his terms I had to have the concept of totality. And then I had to grasp many of them, which means I needed plurality. And then I had to put them all together into a group, which means I needed unity. And of course, in the, ask, in the act of grasping that they are mortal, I had to grasp that they were not immortal. So I needed reality and negation. All those categories had to operate. Uh, don't ask me about any limitations. Um, I had to operate in order to make the simple judgment all men are mortal. Now, some Kantians go on to claim that all 12 categories and this is how they interpret Kant, must operate in any single judgment. And of course, if that's the case, then they would claim that just proves conclusively you cannot get these categories or concepts from experience, because to have the most elementary sense experience, this is green, I'd have to have a whole fantastic 12 conceptual uh, categories operating to make it possible for me to, to, to think this is green, you see, and therefore, obviously, it must be inbuilt. Well, let's pass on to the last two trinities rapidly. The next one, of course, the big one for Kant. In this case, he finds the following three types of judgment, so-called categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Those are supposed to be three types of judgment. By categorical statement, he means a, roughly a simple, straightforward assertion. Socrates is mortal. This table is large, etc. It's a statement without any ifs, ands, or buts in it. What makes this type of statement possible? All, uh, Socrates is mortal. Well, obviously, we have to have the idea of a thing which has certain qualities. Otherwise, we could never utter such a statement as Socrates is mortal. Kant's term for what we have been calling entity is substance. And for what we call quality, he calls attribute. And this is therefore the category of substance and attribute. That is what underlies and makes possible the uh, simple, straightforward judgment, Socrates is mortal, the table is green, etc. If our experience wasn't organized by our minds into entities possessing certain characteristics, we could never make these categorical assertions. Yet we do make them. And we know that we can't get entities from experience. Remember Hume from two weeks ago? Therefore, 
concept, substance, or entity must be a category. Next in this trinity is the hypothetical judgment. That's a judgment of the if-then type. If it's raining, then the ground will be wet. If you put a match into a tank full of hydrogen, then you're going to have trouble, etc. That's a hypothetical type of judgment. What is the category that makes this type of judgment possible? Obviously, we have to have the idea to make this type of judgment of one thing necessitating the next, of one thing bringing about the next, of one thing causing the next. In other words, cause and effect must be one of the categories. This is the climax, you see, where we get to answering you. Cause and effect must be one of the categories, and we can read it off from the existence of the hypothetical judgment. Our minds have the category of cause and effect, which we clearly can't get from experience, remember again Hume, and yet which shows up whenever we say if then. And therefore, that's another one to add to the list. Now, the third one here I'm going to pass by, because it has no plausibility at all. The disjunctive judgment is as a judgment of the form either or. Either God created the world or it always existed. And from that, believe it or not, we read off the category reciprocity. We just passed that by. Then finally, just to finish the picture in a sentence, there is a trinity revolving around modality, as it's called, the mode in which subject and predicate are put together. And here you have three possibilities. You might say one possibility is S may be P. That's called the problematic judgment. Socrates may be sick. It's possible that he's sick. What makes that kind of judgment possible? The category possibility. So possibility and impossibility is an a priori concept which makes it possible for us to utter maybe. Then there is what's called the assertoric. That's a simple st a statement, something is the case. Not maybe it's the case, but it actually is the case. Socrates is happy. What makes that possible? It says comp the category existence, existence and non-existence. Now you may ask, what's the difference between existence and reality? I've never found out uh, that, uh, the answer to that question, but in effect, if he hasn't taken care of reality in one set, it's come down in the other, but both existence and reality are categories. And the last is not S may be P or S is P, but S must be P. Two and two must be four. Socrates must be dead. And where did we get the must? Well, not from experience. That must be an a priori category, and that's the category of necessity. Necessity and contingency are also categories. Well, you got 12 categories into existence now, to be sure, very rapidly. You see the arbitrariness of uh, this procedure of reading off the categories from the uh, list of types of judgments. To sum it up, whenever we judge, we have to judge in certain necessary ways. The reason those ways are necessary is because that's the way our minds have to put together concepts. Those necessary forms of judging express the innate structure of the human mind. It's only because we possess certain inbuilt concepts that we're able to judge at all. In other words, to function conceptually. So when you utter any proposition, it's not only uh, space and time that's contributed by the mind, but all of the crucial concepts that you need to utter any proposition. Unity, plurality, totality, reality, negation, causality, entity, possibility, necessity, existence, etc. All of those are a priori contributions of the mind, and you are then simply, whenever you think, thinking in terms and forms subjectively dictated by the nature of the human mind. You can't know any of them to have any applicability to reality. Reality is completely unknowable.
Now on that note, let us take a break. I assure you the worst is now over. You said Kant still believed in God, but that he had substituted collective human consciousness for God. So did Kant say man's mind said, let there be God, so there was? No, unquestionably no. God, remember, is noumenal, which means he exists entirely independently of us. Anything in the noumenal world is independent of us and is not a result of the structure of collective human consciousness. So when I said Kant substituted collective human consciousness for God's, I, I even tried to cover that point in the lecture by saying, remember, that man's consciousness did not, however, for Kant, have the creative powers that God's did. God, according to the Judeo-Christian view, actually brought reality, not just the way it appeared to God, but reality in itself into existence. For Kant, man doesn't have that kind of creative power. He can't create a world out of a void. All he can do is create a world as it appears to him. And therefore, he certainly is not the creator of God. What is Kant's concept of identity? Is this one of his categories? No. Identity is not a category. If you mean identity in the sense of the law of identity, everything is what it is, that is not a synthetic proposition. The law of identity is an analytic proposition. A is A. Remember the definition of an analytic proposition. Analytic proposition is one in which the very definition of the subject includes the predicate. You can get the predicate out of the subject simply by logical analysis. Well, A is A is the paradigm, perfect example then of an analytic statement because the predicate is identical to the subject. Therefore, it simply restates the subject as a classic example of an analytic statement. As such, says Kant, uh, uh, his uh, categories do not turn out anal uh, analytic material. Analytic material just represent our conceptual manipulations. His categories are concerned always with synthesizing and with producing, therefore, synthetic a priori propositions, and uh, therefore the law of identity uh, is not his uh, uh, business, he says. In fact, he makes it very clear in the critique. He says, as far as the laws of logic are concerned, and that includes, of course, the law of identity, he agrees entirely with Aristotle. Uh, he's taking over the laws of logic from Aristotle, uh, he says. He has the greatest respect for Aristotle. He says that repeatedly. He wouldn't dream of tampering with the laws of logic and so on, and he proceeds to try to use them in his proof, which we're going to look at next week, of the categories. So his whole system rests upon Aristotelian logic, and he wouldn't think of touching it. The division of labor, as he saw it, is in effect Aristotle took care of analytic truths, and he, Kant, is going to take care of synthetic truths, you see. Now, needless to say, this is a hopeless division of labor. And I mean not only because the whole analytic synthetic distinction is invalid. Kant, when he uses logic, is actually using the laws of logic as a complete stolen concept because on his philosophy he has no way whatever of establishing. Uh, we can explore this for a moment since this is a point that will not be in the lectures, but it's a significant point uh, on Kant. Aristotle claimed that he arrived at the law of identity, or the law of contradiction, excluded middle, by directly perceiving reality. He perceived certain things are so, and therefore he, uh, that the, the cup is a cup, the microphone is a microphone, the wristwatch is a wristwatch, and he just abstracted from there, A is A. And therefore he had a foundation for the law of identity, it was a direct law of reality. Now Kant wants very desperately to use the laws of logic because he wants to give what he considers a logical airtight proven case. But now what is his account of why the laws of logic are valid? They no longer can be valid because they correspond to facts of reality, because reality is now unknowable. So what must be Kant's account of logic? Well, he hints at it in his book on logic. He suggests it unclearly, and his later followers made it uh, fully clear. The general Kantian view on logic is this. 
Laws of logic are not laws of reality. They are laws of human psychology. They are laws governing how human beings necessarily have to think when they analyze concepts, see, when they engage in deductive reasoning. And therefore, what is the justification for the laws of logic? Simply that this is the way people have to think. It happens to be, this is what the later, the later uh, Kantian said, it happens to be a brute fact that human, the human mind is so constructed that men have to believe that A is A, and that nothing can be A and non-A at the same time in the same respect. But that's just an irreducible fact of the structure of human consciousness. Well, of course, once you look at it that way, once you take that view, you cannot establish it. Because the question is, how does Kant know that human beings have to think that way? What does he do in the face of human beings holding contradictions? Now, if obedience to the law of contradiction is a necessary law of the human mind, you could not account for the fact of people holding contradictions. See, Aristotle has no problem with people holding contradictions. Uh, because Aristotle simply says, well, you're wrong. You're violating the law of identity, which is based on reality. But if you say the laws of logic are nothing but laws of governing the human mind, then as soon as somebody violates those laws, they're not laws anymore. If they're not laws anymore, why should we think in accordance with them? Just in the same way, if you say the law of gravity is a law governing the behavior of matter, and if things started to violate it, you would have to say, well, so much the worse for the law of gravity, then it isn't true. And uh, uh, Kant's view on logic reduces it simply to the way people actually think. And since, in fact, people can hold contradictions, he destroys the foundation of logic and is left in the position that he can't justify the very laws of logic he's using for his inferences. Somebody points out that I left out the, the name of the fourth set of categories, actually the third. The first three are, quant, are the qu categories of quantity. That's unity, plurality, totality. The next three are the categories of quality, and that's reality, negation, limitation. The next three are the categories of relation, and that was uh, substance and attribute, cause and effect, and reciprocity. And the last three are the categories of modality, and that is possibility and impossibility, existence and non-existence, um, necessity and contingency. So the name I left out was categories of relation. Why is the proof that categories exist necessary when Kant has to go about proving the existence of the specific categories? Well, because the specific uh, uh, categories in the metaphysical deduction, in fact, are not a proof of anything. If I simply read off to you 12 forms of judgment and say those forms of judgment involve certain concepts uh, that make them possible, even supposing we were to grant that, the question would be, well, why so what? Why couldn't those concepts uh, derive from experience? Why do they have to be innate in the structure of the mind? So uh, the purpose of the so-called metaphysical deduction is simply to give you the clue as to what the categories would be if there are any. See, it's simply the way of finding out what they would be if there were some. This is all the only way he could imagine that they would show up in the form of judgment. But then the question still is, well, how do you know those are categories and not just concepts derivable in principle from experience? Now, I, I left out still another part, which those of you heroic enough to remain in question, this uh, may as well know. In the transcendental deduction, he claims to show that certain categories are necessary in order that we're able to perceive spatial temporally. In metaphysical deduction, he reads off those cat a list of categories from the forms of judgment. And now the question he confronts is, how do you know that the categories that correspond to the forms of judgment are the ones that are required to make spatial temporal perception possible? So there's then a whole new section of the critique, which is called the analytic principle, in which he takes them either one at a time or in groups of three, and tries to show that the very category that he got from 
the form of judgment is the very one that's necessary in order to experience space and time, so he brings the two together, you see. So what I call the metaphysical deduction is for him really simply the clue as to what the categories would be if there were any. Do the mind and its categories exist in the noumenal or the phenomenal world? Well, about the categories, we can answer without question. And I didn't introduce the word category. Category is Kant's name for the a priori synthesizing activities on the conceptual level. And there's 12. Those are definitely noumenal. We cannot perceive them. They're not accessible to experience. They exist beneath the level of experience. They are therefore noumenal. It follows, of course, that we can't know what the categories are in themselves, because we can't know anything as it is in itself. All we can know, in effect, is that something X is there, and that the result of it is we have all these features put uh, in our experience. As to the question, what about the mind? Well, Kant would say, do you mean the mind in itself, or the mind as it appears to us? The self in itself exists noumenally. The self as it appears to us exists phenomenally. Thus, you introspect. You, in some sense, are aware of yourself. Your thoughts, your feelings, your hopes, your emotions, your loves, your hates, that's all a part of you and that's accessible to your direct experience. In that sense, your mind, yourself, is phenomenal. You can experience it by introspection. But, of course, that's just the way you yourself appear to yourself. And you can see that because even your introspective data are already governed by time. See, you have one experience and then another and then another. The self in itself, of course, is not temporal. That's noumenal, and therefore we can have no concept of it. In fact, there's a big question whether there is a distinction in reality between reality in itself and yourself in yourself, because quantity is applicable only phenomenally. So for all we know, there's only one gigantic self of which all our phenomenal selves are just reflections. Kant didn't accept that thesis. Hegel did. Hegel's view, in effect, could, uh, I don't know whether I was about to say simply, you couldn't put anything Hegel says simply, but his view would, am uh, would amount from this perspective to saying, let's just have one gigantic self, which is reality, and all of us are just expressions. Kant doesn't commit himself. All he says is, whatever exists in itself is unknown. 